Welcome back to the morning show here on Arise News. Our first guest is the 38-year-old presidential candidate of the Change for Nigeria Party, Emmanuel Etim. Before running for office, Emmanuel dedicated his life to youth development. As technical advisor at the African Union, he implemented the African Union Young Professionals Program and Youth Volunteer Corps and organized the African Union Summit of Heads of State and Government on the theme of youth empowerment and development. Prior to the AU, he worked as regional youth specialist in the office of UNFPA, representative to the AU. Today, he'll be sharing his presidential blueprint if elected into office. Welcome to the morning show, Mr. Etim. Welcome to, to me, too. Thank you very much for having me. So you jumped right in and are taking advantage of the Not Too Young to Run Act because at 38, it's afforded you the opportunity to run for president. How would you assess its impact, that is, of the act in this electoral cycle? And what other legislation or measures can be established to create a more favorable environment for the youth to participate at the highest levels of politics? Well, I think that the, the Not Too Young to Run law was a very important transformation in how young people participate, especially for someone who's traveled the world and Africa wide, trying to encourage more political space for participation and the rest. Uh, and I did take advantage of it, but not because um, it was just my age, but because I've also been preparing myself to run for office in the last two decades. Hence, the reason I exposed myself to global policy making, decision making across the world within international government you know, processes, even before I left Nigeria for the African Union. Um, I, I think when you talk about youth political participation, there is representation and then also there's appointment. I think that for the landscape to transform, we don't really need much legislation to change. What we now need is political decisions to be made around generational leadership and wealth transfer. For example, I, I'm expecting to see that um, not just 40 percent, but we should be seeing 50 percent of appointments going to young people. And I don't mean as social media handlers or communication strategists, I mean as ministers, as ambassadors, as, as DGs and so on. The second aspect to that also, we need to see a procurement act that ensures that 45% no less of all public procurement goes to young people who own businesses are under the age of 40 years old. Those two will change the landscape of how young people engage and participate in a political process in this country. Well, in your manifesto, you say you want to improve on um, made in Nigeria products. Um, without the, the mere rhetoric, can you tell us how you actually intend to do this? Well, first of all, we recognize that made in Nigeria products exportation uh, and probably availability in the Nigerian market is it's, it's a question of quality standards and as well is a question of um, what we consume as a population. I think the biggest challenge with what is made in Nigeria and the consumption of Nigerians is that we don't package, store, and keep them in a way that we can have access to them. That's number one. So one of the things we are looking at as a campaign, as a party, and as an economic blueprint is to ensure that what is made in Nigeria meets international standard. What is made in Nigeria incorporates the technology and the science that is required to bring it up to date with what Nigerians want. Don't forget, Nigerians are a sophisticated consumer population. And so we are not looking at made in Nigeria just because it's made in Nigeria. We're saying made in Nigeria is globally competitive, globally, uh, globally standardized. And then made in Nigeria has ensured that the Nigerians are incorporating the education, the research to make those products relevant to where the people want it to be. It must respond to the needs of the population. It must in expand to the aspirations of the population. So what do I mean by this? Take the, let's take an example. A goosey soup as you see it. A goosey soup itself can be made in Nigeria. A made in Nigeria must not be clothes and shoes as we see it around the world. That when it's coming from Africa, it has to be art and craft. Well, that seems to be our you know, interest. It's not going to sell so much because it's right next to the door. So how do we make a goosey soup a made in Nigeria product that I can go to the store and pick up in the pack, put it in the pot and make it out, or export as well? So we are looking at a made in Nigeria that is focused on not just local consumption, but exportable as well. In America, for example, the largest consumer market for America are Americans before they start looking at, a, at an international market to expand their business or cooperation. And we begin to focus on how we ensure that Nigerians can consume what they produce, but not because it's made in Nigeria, but because it meets the standards, the international quality, and international best practice for what it is Nigerians want to have as a sophisticated consumer population. 
We will come back to your manifesto, Mr. Emmanuel Etchum, but um, you did say you have been preparing yourself for office for the last two decades, and your first shot at, at it is Asso Rock Villa, uh, the number one position in the country. Tell us, why do you want to become Nigeria's president, and why should Nigerians vote for you? Well, you need to understand that it's not the first shot. Before here, this 20 years, if you check my profile, you'll see that I've been involved in so many parts of the Nigerian polity in terms of policy making and, you know, dem democratic experience. From what we call the national policy on youth, three different versions of it, to education policy, to the health policy, the national health insurance scheme, to the Niger Delta interventions, and the list to mention are many. I've been involved in all of those education curriculum review. I've been very active in all of those till up in 2008 positions. when I left the country to the African Union. No, no, what I'm saying is what is elected positions? The people that we have had there with all the experience of previous elected positions have led this country down. So it's not about being an elected position or appointed position, about what your interest is, what your track record of agenda, interest to, you know, to serve the country and issues you are passionate about. So that's number one. Number two is, as far as I'm looking at it, when it comes to why should Nigerians vote for me, I always say this. Nigerians need to vote for somebody, not really just talking about the issues or repeating the problems, but somebody who's able to explain in very clear terms the kinds of things they'll be doing that will have a, you know, uh, a multiplying effect on transforming the lives of every Nigerian that understands that the way we live our lives in Nigeria is not, it's, 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 it's against our fundamental human rights, and it's not a privilege that, a, you know, that a politician does a road or builds a hospital. In fact, those are not the things they should be doing the way they are doing it. A person is coming to say, listen, I'm here to focus on Nigerians, people-centered approach to, you know, to governance and, 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 and growth and development, not the elitist approach to, you know, to development. A person is coming to say, I want to change the way Nigeria works from a government-driven approach to, gov to, to, to the economy to a private sector driven approach to the economy. Where Nigerians are the ones who run the economy, the Nigerian business are the ones who run the economy. And Nigeria is focused on getting its rented from taxation and not the current approach of you know rent from crew, which is 95% of the revenue of this country. So as long as government continues to control who, you know, the revenue determines who gets the money, how they get the money, for what they get money get the money for, that Nigeria we want will not happen. So what I'm saying is Nigerians should vote from because they are looking at the person going to come to ensure that Nigerians, the life wealth of Nigerians at the center of their economic and individual aspirations. And it's the fundamental human right for a Nigerian, for example, to have free 24-hour access to electricity, to have a job, to have a home, a, a reliable job, a well-paying job, to have a house, to buy, be able to buy a phone, to go on a holiday. These are the basic rights of a Nigerian. Let's look at the African Continental Free Trade Agreement. In Nigeria, at some point, it was full steam yeah. ahead. The Federal Executive Council gave their consent. We actually, Nigeria actually applied to host the Secretariat. And the next thing, President Muhammadu Buhari canceled his trip to Rwanda to sign this agreement, and the government announced that they're still in talks with stakeholders. Some have criticized this. What is your position? Should we join the free trade zone well, or not? I, I think, first of all, um, I, I need to also mention here that the initial drafting process and the concept behind the free trade zone, uh, the continental free zone, I was part of the technical team that developed that document and process extensively. And I have argued across the world in different processes, especially when we talked about how do we finance you know, Africa's response to the sustainable development goals. We can actually make more money selling across Africa than abroad. The market for Nigerian made products is in Africa to begin with. Yeah, that's number one. Number two is that um, Nigeria should actually be focused more on trade and investment across the region than security, as we say it. So from the beginning, my criticisms of this administration's approach to Nigeria has, not, has been that we should be talking trade and not security per se, because without economic growth and prosperity, security is going to be impossible and a killing tax to achieve. Nigeria should be part of that conversation, although the initial talk from Cairo to Cape Town had 22 countries, and through several negotiations, it was important that you cannot have such an agreement without needing to bring in Nigeria into the picture. And so here we are at a situation where I don't see why the, the administration stepped away from that meeting and is having conversations. But because there were certain clauses, for example, say, okay, you know, the visa-free regime allow people to move free movement across the continent, and a couple of those kinds of issues that Nigeria felt, you know, what was going to expose the country to illegal immigration from across the continent. But the question is, we've had the ECOWAS regime since. I don't know how many illegal immigration has been coming from the ECOWAS region. But we need to start asking sensible questions as a country. 
country. To what extent are Nigerians to do certain jobs? If they're able to bring people out of this country from the region or from the continent as it were, who will do jobs Nigerians no longer want to do? We should think about that. This is the way to move the economy. So for me, Nigeria should not just be part of the, you know, for, for the continental free trade. We should see it as an asset, as an opportunity for us to expand what is made in Nigeria to start with, to, inf to increase our influence on the continent and the region, and ensure that Nigeria is part of the continent's you know, drive forward and not really take a position that we don't have the power or the economy to influence. Well, in trying to reason for your um, um, reason for contesting this um, high number one position in Nigeria, tell us what your compelling political ideology is. I think my compelling political ideology is uh, in Nigeria that works for the benefit of Nigerians. I think that's the beginning and the most important part of it. In Nigeria that is working for the benefit of Nigerians. In Nigeria where we understand that you know the average Nigerian earns no more than 700,000 naira below to 300 300,000 naira. That's 60 to 70 percent of the working population of this country. How do we change that? In Nigeria, where it is about Nigerians, you know, doing business and making profit in their enterprise, it's about a Nigerian having access to basic necessities of life. It's about a Nigeria where the Nigerian the citizen has the pride, you know, and the self identity to identify themselves publicly and around the world as Nigerian. So the compelling ideology I have is that we can no longer run a country where it's not about the Nigerian and it's about a few economic and political elites that have so-called colored the country and kept the wealth within themselves and have turned into a family enterprise. Now let's go back to your manifesto and uh, of interest uh, for me uh, at this time is education. You are proposing elimination of courses with 50% postgraduate employment rates. Uh, you also talk about university autonomy. Yes. Now, ASO has been on strike for more than two yes. months now, and crux of the matter is funding of the education sector. Um, what would you do differently to bridge the gap and ensure that we don't find ourselves in this recurring uh, strike action by teachers, especially in tertiary uh, um, schools. Yes, it's very important you said what you said about my plans for the education sector. And I've always said in the entire campaign period that we do not have yet an education sector. My principles, my campaign is based on three pillars, science, technology, and education. We don't have an education sector. Education has a defined orientation of what it should do and how it should operate. We don't have that yet. And one of the things that's important about education autonomy is not university or you know, autonomy. It's not just about allowing universities to run on their own. It's the capacity for universities to be able to raise the money and run the institution in a profitable manner that allows them to invest in research, to invest in science, to invest in products and services that can bring innovation to the country's uh, you know, uh, uh, economic agenda. Number two, when you talk about po you know, removal of 50% of um, you know, courses that don't have more than, you know, they don't have more than 50% enrollment, you know, job creation. It is a, it's, it's, it's too late for us to be thinking about that because China did this 50 years ago. If a course is no longer giving you more than 50% post-employment, why are you still keeping that course in the, in the curricula? It means the market no longer needs it. It's almost like somebody trying to buy three and a half floppy disk drive in a, in a country where now you're using flash drives or you're trying to go around the place look for, for you know, looking for um, a, 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 a black and white television where, as we to the people are looking for flat screens. We need to move uh, the thinking forward. We need to change the way we think. We need to change the way education system works. The reasons why this ASU strike continues to linger on is because government wants to still run an economy that is socialist, but operating a capitalist, as it were, uh, claiming on paper that we're a capitalist economy. The universities should not be fully government funded. Government should put in policies in place, and we are planning to do that. I will ensure they don't just have autonomy, but they're able to respond to the country's need for innovation, for the country's need for creativity, and for the, to be the place where the, you know, the, the how do you, what do you call it, the, the, um, the intellectual advancement of the Nigerian enterprise is based upon or is fleshed from. Your campaign slogan, Making Nigeria Successful, involves turning Nigeria into a tiger economy. Can we have more details of that vision of yours? I already started by saying that we're going to move out, you know, 45% of public procurement to the hands of young people. We're going to ensure that 50% of all political appointments are going to youth. Now, how does that happen? How does that deliver this country where Nigerians are rich? I gave you an example. Do you know that, I'll give you an example. Do you know that $22 billion is lost for, by Nigeria due to food shortage, uh, lack of electricity, uh, uh, you know, power shortages? Do you realize that for cassava farmers, for example, 
all over all over the country. We lose about 16 million tons of cassava due to you know within 48 hours of harvest due to lack of electricity on site, and that's about a billion dollar in losses. So we, let's take it from that perspective. For example, that for this country to be rich is very easy. For a Nigerian small enterprise, a trader, a farmer, a restaurant owner to actually be rich, it's very predictable. But the, the issue here is that we're not having the implementations of the policies that ensure and guarantees that is in place. Why should Nigerians pay for access to electricity? You know, for example, when we, we have eight hours of sunshine, a windy coastal region, one of the windiest coastal regions in the world, where you can have, you know, a solar or renewable energy installation that puts in place and ensures that, you know, in two years you no longer pay for electricity. How do we make Nigeria a place where everybody succeeds? That's the matter about because we know what has to be done. We know that it's a lie for you to say that you're going to create, you're going to add 22,000 megawatts to our electricity grid. It's impossible to do because the current electricity grid we have, or it's called our power lines, are a cake. They were built in 1960 and cannot even carry or transmit 7,000 megawatts of electricity. Everybody knows that. The administration knows this one, the last one. Between 1999 and 2015, we've spent two trillion naira trying to improve our electricity sector, and we've not added 3,000 megawatts to that. And yet, we have we need about 160,000 megawatts for the current 180,000, uh, 180 million population. That can says... be addressed by just allowing a policy. Your plan, um, yeah. your plan details how you're going to bring down the price of solar energy from 500,000 naira for three bedroom flat to 100,000. How are you going to accomplish this? You see, there are two ways to do this. Number one is already, as we know it, because of the mass, you know, the, 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 the uptick in, in, in the use of solar and all of that, it has reduced the price worldwide in the last 10 years to eight, by 80%. So it can be done. The cost of energy, for example, new rene renewable energy, using renewable energy, reduces the cost of that by 80%, 87%. These studies are available, and we know it. The Henry Ball Foundation did that study with the Nigerian government some two years ago. So we know this cost can really come down. I'll give you an example. Intellectual property. In the days of HIV AIDS, for example, when a treatment for, to reduce an ARV, an antiretroviral drug for everybody, was costing about $1,000 per year for someone living with HIV AIDS. True interventions in, you know, trips flexibility, trade intellectual property right flexibilities, that cost came down from $1,000 to $100. So we're saying if we implement scale, if we go to scale, China has done it with bicycles, for example, go to scale, we can bring down that cost. And policies that remove, for example, you know, import and custom tariffs around importing will be changed. We have to bring in the factories that can manufacture those solar panels and those batteries in this country. And sometimes those can be done through very sensible and you know clear deals around joint, joint venture agreements. We know we don't have the technologies, but we can reach agreement to bring the technology and bring, and then we pro, you know, provide the raw materials and we, we manufacture those things in this country. Reduce the cost of manufacturing and you'll see that the prices will come down very significantly. Well, security is a, a great challenge in Nigeria and we've had the clamor for state policing in a country um, with a population of over 174 million people who have to contend with just about 371,800 police officers. Now tell us what you intend to do in proving, to improve law enforcement and policing. Maybe, as you just said, using technology and education. Technology, science, and education remains the theme. So first of all, you see, two days ago, I was flying from Calabar here, and the commissioner, I think the commissioner of police was also flying on the same flight. He came to the airport with more than 50 policemen, 50, two trucks in front and back, and others running on their feet. Please explain to me, if the commissioner of police alone can carry, you know, can come to the airport, he's going to the airport with 50 policemen, which ones are left now to ensure, you know, security of lives and property in the country? That's just one public official. So let's take that as an example. We must destructure the police force and law enforcement as we see it. In my administration, we are not going to longer have the federal police force as we have it. We would rather have a federal bureau of intelligence, we'll have a behavior analysis unit, and we have a federal central intelligence unit or anti-terrorism unit. These three will have directors that report to the national security advisor. And what we have as the police force now will function at the state level, where they are more accountable to the, to the judiciary and the legislature. So that, number one, will improve, for example, one, the access to, the, to law enforcement, the effectiveness of law enforcement, and the accountability of law enforcement. Then the other part of it is to ensure that the cost of running the law enforcement can be locally generated. And this is because if you put the states to work and states recognize that the responsibility to raise revenue and use that revenue for the benefit of the population, then you can employ more people. And with technology, science, and proper education, you literally can get a policeman to do what 10 policemen could have done. And we see that happening around the world. So yes, we will use technology 
And, and we've seen around the world, for example, the last 20 years in some advanced countries, the introduction of you know, uh, 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 CCTV cameras, uh, the introduction of um, DNA, uh, you know, DNA uh, science, the introduction of uh, fingerprint device, you know, science and all of that has helped to improve policing, helped to improve law enforcement, you know, helped to increase security of lives and property. So that we're going to introduce the way how we live our lives in this country. So policing will not just be a law enforcement as it is, will not just be a matter of you know punitive you know measures to punish people for crimes committed but also have preventive measures as well included well you have a plan to end hunger in nigeria um just about two weeks yes. ago the president had uh, an exclusive interview with this day and arise news where he said uh, about 12 million farmers now have jobs and in fact that people were leaving white collar jobs to go back to the farm um what is your assessment of the agricultural revolution that this administration talks so much about? And what is your end hunger plan? Everywhere around the world, I used to serve on the African Union private sector finance team for agriculture development in Africa. So I'm really surprised who gave the president, you know, the, the current uh, administrator, administration that talking point because we all know and even the former Minister of Agriculture, who is now the world AFDB you know, president, where, did say it. farming is not profitable. Around the world, we know that farming, farming is the least productive sector of any economy. In 2006, we saw a large increase in job creation, and not because people took up more farming, because people left farming to the, to the service sector. What we should be talking about is how do we increase the value addition on the value chain of agriculture. So from mechanization, input as, you know, uh, to improve what we do as farming. And then we need to also understand something about farming. The way we practice farming in this country, smallholders farming, is also the problem. Smallholder farming cost has about 50% post-harvest losses in this country. And yet, we still invest in uh, smallholder farming. So we're not going to have much progress that approach. Rather, what I propose that we're going to do, which we have in our plan, is to ensure that we increase value addition in the agricultural sector, we increase proper lending, patient capital and single digit lending to the agricultural sector where around the world people are lending for two to three percent in nigeria they're lending for 25 percent for one to two year terms we need to change all of that 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 narrative and to end hunger we need to realize that for we to end hunger we also have to change the way we eat okay we have to change the way we harvest and store i give the example of what happens in 48 hours after you harvest a cassava for example you can harvest cassava for example in this country about 50% of what we harvest as fruit and vegetables goes to waste. So that can become, you know, you know fruit juices. Um, our maize is not exported because of our flactosine, a disease that affects maize across Africa. The way we store and harvest is a problem. We can fix that. So storage capacity in this country is 300,000 tons, whereas um, our harvest of maize alone is about 7 million tons. We need to open that sector up for people to create businesses around storage facilities for food in this country. So our plan to end hunger is to ensure that food, food nutrition no child dies again from, from, uh, from malnutrition. It's to ensure that nobody goes away hunger, hungry in this country because they can't have food, and not because they can't have food, because we still use, either we are dependent on uh, smallholder farming, we are depending on uh, uh, rain-fed agriculture, or we are depending on uh, smallholder farming. We need to change the way we do the agriculture in this country and ensure that commercial agriculture, not just because it's large scale or large you know, hectares of land, but it, in, it brings in the technology, the tools and the machinery that allows you to farm to, to, to farm, to, 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 to harvest, to transform what you're farming and harvesting into, into products that we can consume all year round. You've said you'd like to build 20 new domestic airports. In what states or cities would they be situated and what is the rationale behind this? First of all, you need to understand that it costs so much to move across Nigeria. To go from Amsterdam to Barcelona is a six-hour journey drive, uh, flight, right? And that costs you about 65 uh, uh, euro, which is about you know, $80 or thereabout. In Nigeria, to fly you know, from Calabar to Abuja, or from Abuja to Lagos, sometimes you pay $42,000 with about $150 or thereabout, or sometimes $70,200. It's un unbelievable. Why? Because we have such large taxes. That's number one. Number two. There are regional flights that we are not taking advantage of. For example, I could fly from Calabar to Portacot, or from Portacot to Abuja, or within the regions. So our plan to create these airports is, is recognizing that they can be traveled within the west, for example, they can travel within the south-south, they can be traveled within the east, they can be traveled within the north-central, the northeast, and so on. We need to promote those travels, and we need smaller planes that can do those routes. And then we now look at bigger travels within the, you know, connecting the country across six geopolitical zones. What I'm also saying is that we must ensure that enterprise, that 
that business sector is thriving. As it's structured today, the business of air travel is really between Lagos, Abuja, Portacot, Kanu sometimes, and then a few other states, you know, are struggling to get the piece. Why? Because the cost of air travel is too high. And when you look at those tickets, sometimes they, they tell you that the, air, the actual air travel ticket is 5,000 and taxes. Are forty, you know, uh, are forty thousand out of that amount. So who is getting that taxes? What is the money being used for? The FIRS, for example, told us, for example, that last year, 2017, they got a revenue of about four trillion naira, 4.6 or 4.7 trillion naira, which is 50% of the 2018, 2019 budget. So the question then, I'm, what I'm trying to say, in other words, is that if the taxes we are putting on the cost of ticket that is making it expensive and preventing, for example, profitable enterprise according to regional rate, regional lines are not are not really helping the budget, then let's take it out and let's reduce the cost of travel and ensure that people can travel within the regions and promote economic activity at those regions. Because probably that's the first and immediate step before you're talking about intra 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 city uh, intrastate rail lines. Well, let's look at your portfolio now. You, you you've been a member of many national policy committees. Have any of your recommendations come to bear? Oh, yes. Um, you should know, for example, that uh, uh, what we have today, uh, what we have today as a, a Nigerian Federal Ministry of Youth Affairs, we're part of the roles that we played in defining and designing the national youth policy and implementation framework in Nigeria. What we have today as a sexuality education curriculum in Nigeria, or family life education curriculum in Nigeria, were part of the roles we played in the education curriculum implementation. What we have today as a national health insurance scheme were part of the roles I played, not just being participant, but as a resource person, in many cases as a consultant in developing the content, the, you know, the narrative around some of those work, um, also in some other cases as a research person in the population program development for Nigeria. So yes, many of my recommendations have come through um, across board. I mean, I've been part of this business for, for two decades. So a lot of my recommendations, the Niger Delta Technical Committee work, I was a lead resource person, especially bringing the input on youth and getting the memorandums from Nigerians into the narrative, into analysis that the, 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 the plenary was using to make recommendations. So I played a lot of roles, and those recommendations went through very much. Mm. Mr. Atim, you have crossed your... Uh, T's and dotted your I's in your manifesto, you have highlighted challenges and the yearnings of the people as well as providing solutions for them. But really, what are your chances going into this election? Well, my chances are abroad and because, I, like I said to people, the, it's in the hands of Nigerians to decide whether they want change or they want to continue the rhetorics of we don't like them, they're not working for us, they're not helping us. Uh, we're in a country where proximity to power is the, proximity to power, access to people in power, relationship with people in power is the only way to, man no man is willing to make it. You go around the country and you see the richest are those either who have government contracts or politicians. So my chances are this. If majority of Nigerians, and I see from the INEC you know, data, about 60 plus million are young people under 35 years. If a majority of those who vote for me have won the election, if they vote knowing that one, they don't want to travel abroad anymore because they want better education, but they can get better education here. If they know that they want access to universal health care and they no longer pay for out of pocket expenses for health care, which impoverishes more people than any intervention can take them out of. If they know that they want to have access to own a home, go on holiday, they want to have a well-paying job in this country, and they want to ensure they have the fundamental human right to participate in politics, we want to see young people as ministers, as ambassadors, we want to see young people own businesses that are you know, profitable and can compete with the rest of the world. We can have a Facebook that is made up of Nigeria, from Nigeria, we can have a future you know, Hyperloop company that coming out of Nigeria, a future Google out of Nigeria, a future Amazon out of Nigeria. Then they're looking at me because I'm the only one that has shown, not just in blueprint, but in terms of track record, in terms of interest, in terms of agenda, in terms of ideology, that I can get it done and I'm interested in getting those things to happen. You were previously linked to the new progressives movement and are now with the Change Nigeria Party. You also changed your running mate. Yes. So can you inform us of what caused these like changes to happen in your campaign and what informed your choice of Zainab Hassan Abubakar as your running mate? Let me start with, with, you know, with Zainab. Zainab is a wonderful woman um, and if you listen to her story, she's very passionate about the issues that uh, uh, she works on. She's been working on issues of entrepreneurship, 
or uh, individual women's participation as an entrepreneur herself. She's, uh, she's been very active around the issues of helping the less privileged, you know, get education using her personal resources to advance that and her business enterprise through corporate social responsibility. Um, Zena comes to me as the kind of vice president that will not overwork himself or herself the way that the current vice president is working himself out because the president she's going to work in has an agenda that is clear and she will literally be able to ensure that domestic matters are managed very properly. Um, that's, that's number one. The other part of the question you've asked, why did I change? Well, first of all, if you, list, if you followed my, my trajectory, I've always said I wanted a woman as vice president. Because who knows, after eight years of being in president, she may be interested to run for office herself as president. So I may be contributing to ensuring that we have the first woman president if, you know, uh, uh, in Nigeria. That's, that's another part to it. Um, the question about why I moved from New Progressive Movement to the Change in Nigeria Party, well, it's, it's a question of first ideology. It's a question of also um, of the, the structure we have as political parties in this country. The new progressive movement, although led by young people, has been externally influenced by a lot of godfathers from the APC. That's number one. Number two, they canceled the primaries on me just before it was held. So I had to go shopping for a new party. The Change Nigeria Party, led by you know, uh, Comrade Usman Ikeleji, is a fantastic platform because it didn't just only... Uh, offer me the platform to compete and win the primaries. It offered young people who were not content for presidency free nomination forms to run for office. So it was the only party at the time that ensured that if you were not a young person interested in taking advantage of the not too young to run law, you could actually now get it done without money being a challenge. Three, this is the part. This party is is is. Um, um, how do I say, it? if I look at the both of them, one was filled with a lot of young people, the other was is a mixed generation population, but, but now has the ideology I'm interested in, which is job creation. And within the party manifesto, they are focused on creating jobs. And when I came into the party, I liked it because it was not just about you saying, I want to run for president, I'm going to pay my nomination for an expression of interest form, and I'm going to just compete. No, I had to explain what I needed to do and how I could, re I could create three, 35 to 40 million jobs in four years to actually get the form to actually get the opportunity to be to contest for the primaries. So this is one of the things that drew me to the party culture in Nigeria. And I, and I think I made the right choice. And Nigeria will make the right choice to vote this, uh, this party into office. Well, it's interesting that your vice presidential candidate is a woman. You made a, a speech in preparatory of the infamous Beijing Women's Conference. How much will that reflect on, your, on the women inclusiveness in your appointments? I will give 60% of all my appointment to women, and I mean older and younger women. And you need to know that in 1995, I was one of the first young persons to engage in the Beijing preparatory process um, and, you know, out and, and post it, getting the Beijing platform from action implemented in Nigeria. And I was in part of that, you know, part of press for a long, for some while. I even became a part of the something called Women in Nigeria uh, organization. Because as far as I'm concerned, and from the part of Nigeria I'm from, women's rights and women's participation was not really a problem. I didn't even understand the issues growing up because uh, I couldn't see what they call inequality as, we, as I grew older, except for later issues around, you know, sexual violence uh, and other kinds of issues that affect women, you know, inappropriately. The point I'm trying to make here is that although Beijing Platform for Action calls for 30% affirmative action, I, I think I'm moving beyond affirmative action. I'm saying that there's no reason we can have more women in the cabinet, more women in appointment than we've ever had before. And I mean 60%. I'm not, I, I, I'm not talking about giving a few here and there, women affairs is a woman, and then many, uh, women of fin finance women here and there. No. I'm saying 50% of your cabinet is women, yeah? Uh, from appointment of ministers to DGs to ambassadors to special advisors. I went, and not because I just want to give women appointments and or just any woman appointment. We've seen that doesn't work. Competent, capacitated women that can get the job done. And what is the job? To move Nigeria from a very, you know, um, a, a, a patriarchal approach to, to leadership and governance to a more, uh, uh, to a leadership style that is transformatory, that is focused on people, and that's empathic. Barely a month to the election. Uh, do you have any concerns going into this election? Oh, I have several concerns. I'll mention but a few. Number one, um, I, 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 I do hope that INEC stands up to the test of the time to prove that it will ensure that the elections are free and fair. I do worry that the judiciary is under attack to, you know, to prevent um, what some of us believe a rigging will happen and our contestation of that result uh, uh, as well. Uh, the third concern I also have is that the, the, not just the media, the structure has prevented um, many of us who are younger, more competent candidates to be seen and to be heard. Not just around the so-called 
five, uh, you know, two people, uh, two big parties. But this <coughs> notion that you have to have heft and you have to have billions and, and, and so on to spread and to, to, to disperse. The last other issue I have going into elections is that as much as we say no voter buying, no voter selling and so on, Nigerians are so poor. My, my sisters, Nigeria is so poor, and as I travel across the country, town hall meeting rallies, people are asking you for money. They are literally asking you for money to listen to you. They are asking for money to come to your meet, to, to your venues. They are asking for money to to vote for you. They are literally saying, "We want the money now." The guarantee that you do it later is what you do now, and 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 and, and that is a challenge because for those of us who've really who've never stolen public funds or we've never had access to public treasury to enrich ourselves or we paid huge sums of money for sitting allowances and so on. Where do you find that kind of money to pay people to listen to you or to organize meetings and then give people transport money, huge amounts of money to rent crowds to come to you at the stadium or to print so much uh, as merchandise? I have concerns because in some states you're told to go and get an AFCON license before you can uh, uh, before you can go do a rally or do a campaign or put up a banner and so on. And then before you even put up the banner, you have to pay the, the state uh, you know, signature agency a license about five million naira to go you know be able to put up your banner so the cost of you know competitive uh, uh, campaigning has been taken uh, taken so high that legitimate candidates credible candidates are deprived of that because now you have to spend your money wisely the little money you have spending wisely. the final concern I also have here is that I am also worried that our lens to the issue we say we don't want the older people we want the younger people and yet the young people are in front of you now and people are still singing the step to generals into office or claiming that the two biggest parties my worry is Nigerians have not decided yet that they want to change. My worry is Nigerians are probably not educated enough, many, 60% of our adult population are illiterate to understand what it takes to deliver the Nigerians they choose to have. So I'm not just having a worry about the, the politics of you know, you know, security, the politics of INEX logistics on the day, the politics of having the agents on ground to monitor and ensure that the results are counted or ensure they are counted, the monitors are going to be on the site. I imagine I'm having a challenge of an entire ecosystem that impoverishes the Nigerian and continues to ensure that um, the aspiration of Nigerians will not come to the fore. You've expressed all these factors as challenges, which they clearly are, but I want to know how you feel. Do you feel marginalized in any way? Why won't I feel marginalized? I mean, I'll give you, I'll give you an example. For every time um, I, I, I feel marginalized comes from the point where if I don't do, let me give you an example. Most people get hurt because they make noise. They create chaos. They go around fighting, causing trouble, insulting people, calling people by names. That is the way the media responds. So for those of us who are making constructive arguments around the issues, for those of us who are putting ourselves out there to say we are accessible, let's talk about issues, even the media marginalizes us. They don't think we are taking, they don't take us serious enough. And so these are the issues. Gerontocracy is a problem. A, a situation where you feel only an older, hefty looking, big tummied man or, uh, you know, elderly lady is the person that is equipped enough to run the country or to govern the country is also why I feel marginalized. Uh, I, I don't feel marginalized because of my age alone. I feel marginalized because you can see me. I look babyish as it were. I look young, um, which is a blessing, younger than my age. And that also can make me marginalized. Nevertheless, um, uh, I think that the biggest marginalization I have experienced as an individual in this whole process is the marginalization of, of the fact that gerontocracy is real, more real than I thought it was. People don't think you can do it just because you're young. And some people tell, and young people are the ones, even some, some of the young people are the ones saying these things. And then media, the media marginalizes us. I'm, well, I know here, I'm here on your yeah, station and at this time. But, but, <laughs> Mr. Yeah. you here on this platform. I, which is, no, of course, thank you for having me on this platform. I really commend your, your, your invitation to be on this platform, even though on the two, three times you did, I couldn't make it. But I'm, I'm just saying, if you look at the general uh, uh, plethora of activities, being young and contesting for, being, you know, for this office has been marginalization, marginalization all the way. Well, one of your most memorable quotes reads, and I quote, if you cannot prepare the future for young people, then prepare young people for the future, end quote. You're definitely living up to that. So good luck in your quest. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, it's now time for a short break. When we come back, it will be all about art and culture with visual artist Isaac Emma Pye. Stay with us. <laughs> 